Good evening and uh, welcome uh, to this evening's talk. Uh, I'm Kanti Bajpai and I'm director of the Center on Asia and Globalization, which is one of the four research centers at the LKY School of Public Policy. The job of our center is, as the name suggests, to look at Asia. India clearly forms a very large part of uh, the part of Asia that we look at, uh, which is essentially from uh, India uh, eastwards to Japan and then from Russia down to uh, Australia. That's broadly our definition of Asia. Um, so in that context, I'm very happy to welcome uh, uh, Vapalla Balachandran, uh, who is former special secretary in the uh, Indian cabinet secretariat. Um, he's had a very long and distinguished career as, a, as the, uh, an author and columnist, but as a civil servant uh, above all. Um, uh, it's a long CV, and I'm not going to read it out. We're a little bit be behind time. Uh, but just to say that he served in the security and intelligence community, uh, has been on a number of very high-level committees, uh, looking at, in particular also at uh, police reform. Uh, so he brings a great deal of experience in that respect. And uh, I think in the wake of what happened in Mumbai in 2008, uh, I think Mr. Balachandran uh, has abstracted a, a lot of lessons from that uh, terrible, uh, terrible episode. Um, he's the author of National Security and Intelligence Management, A New Paradigm, uh, as also a book called A Life in Shadow, The Secret Story of ACN Nambiar. Um, this is his latest book, Keeping India Safe, The Dilemma of Internal Security, and it's published by HarperCollins this year. Um, so do get hold of it if you can. The uh, topic today is uh, the, the name of the book, and uh, I guess you're going to tell us some of the key lessons learned about the organization of internal security and the difficulties that India faces uh, in that. You'll speak, you said, for about 35 or 40 minutes, and then we'll open up uh, to Q&A. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Balachandran to our midst. Beginning with the, what is known as the best university in the whole of Asia. So I'm deeply grateful to you for allowing me to speak on a new book. Incidentally, I had talked about this uh, book. This book was released uh, on 28, 29th of August in Delhi by our former Vice President, uh, Mr. Ansari. And I went to Washington, D.C. and uh, the U.S. State Department wanted to have a, a presentation to them. So I did it on the 7th of, 5th of uh, September. And then on, uh, I gave a presentation to a uh, uh, select small audience at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. So then I'm now coming to uh, Singapore. What is special about this book, or rather the main theme of the book is, it's often understood that uh, the security threats fa facing India are externally motivated. Uh, I started doubting that. Now, I, I also believe I was in the security establishment for almost 36 years. I also believe that that is the external factors which are contributing to the insecurity in India or the, the law and order problems in India, etc., etc., frequent terrorist attacks. But I started doubting it when I studied the 1998 Coimbatore blast. I don't know how many of you would have heard about it. It's one of the biggest terrorist attacks in uh, Coimbatore, uh, southern city of Coimbatore. 52 people died and about nearly 200, 300 people were badly injured. I went there to Madras, now Chennai, to study and then meet the top officer investigating it. And he told, said that there is no external involvement at all. It is a homegrown terror group. He even said it is not really a professional terror group, but a, a group which was very annoyed at being ousted from a commercial area in Kavito. There is a place called Ukkada. I don't know if you know Tamil Nadu, you know. And they were ousted and so they, they blew up bombs and then uh, killed so many people. Then there is the homegrown Maoist terrorism. The latest uh, US Department compilation of terrorist attacks in India. And when, he, uh, when they um, sort of put together, tabulated the number of uh, attacks in India, they found that India had the third largest number of attacks 
uh, in the whole world. And many people did not know about it. Actually, first was Afghanistan, then Iraq, and third was uh, India, more than even Syria. Now, of course, uh, in Syria, there is a battle going on. There is a regular warfare going on. But according to their yardstick, they said that India had the third largest number of attacks. And who had contributed? Again, the Maoist terror, terror if you call them insurgents or the terror or whatever it is, they are the people. So, then I started studying it. And then I was a member of the two-man committee which went into the systemic failures of 2011 attack in Mumbai. Uh, the, the chief was Mr. Pradhan, who was a former governor of uh, Arunachal Pradesh, and the second person, the service member, or rather, uh, uh, next word was me, and uh, I wrote the whole report. I found that had we set up, had, in, had India set up a vigorous internal security architecture, like what is happening in Singapore, or rather, what, what has been happening in Singapore, and uh, it Perhaps we would have, we could have prevented that attack. That is my conclusion. I have written a number of columns about it. It is. I am not trying to say that India has a million mutinies, as uh, Nobel Prize winner Ram Paul once said. Uh, but it is a fact that certain incidents, which are which have a tendency to occur frequently, could have been prevented with a with a proper architecture. Now, what exactly is the is the problem? That is the theme of this book. Now, in, and for this, I found that the basic problem is our constitution, which in terms of internal security, they had copied the 1935 Government of India Act. 1935 Government of India Act was enacted during the colonial time for a different purpose. That I don't want to say that it's all done in this book. For this, I had to study the our constitution making running between uh, 9 December 1946 to 24 January 1950, 283 sessions. I could access what is called settlement papers. He had, uh, you know, compiled the entire uh, constitutional debate to find out why did we copy this, what is called uh, Schedule 7. Now, what is Schedule? Schedule, there, there are main articles of the constitution, then there are Schedules. Schedules are uh, various things, like for example, distribution of subjects between the center and states. And in that, in 1935, due to certain factors, as a result of three roundtable conferences, 1931, 32, and 33, 33 or 34, uh, three roundtable conferences, the British government published a white paper in which there was a demand for more empowering more uh, the states. So they said police and pub uh, uh, public security will be with the states. Now, we copied it with the effect that the entire law and order, now I will come to that, you know, how, how it, what is the theory of uh, internal security and all that, I will come to that. So, this is the, the crux of the problem is this, that the states, you know, 29 states don't want to give up the power over the maintenance of law and order under a mistaken impression that they are the in charge of security. Gradually, what happened is that we are no law on terrorism. In fact, we had two laws which were all, uh, you know, abolished. And so we have presently no, uh, on, no law on terrorism. So we consider that as a mass murder. So when, who will investigate? It is the police who will investigate. So with the effect that transnational and interstate crime are also being investigated by the state police who are not equipped with this. So that is the main theme of the book. So I have given the, uh, the initial years how we tackled it. Initially, as partition riots and there are various other things, Telangana rebellions, etc., etc., Naga rebellion, all these were tackled at the level of center. Center took the prime initiative at that time. This type of architecture was not yet uh, gone in, although the constitution was there. Then came, then, then I, the next chapter is about how did we arrive at this constitutional provision. It's, that is, as I said, you know, one chapter I had to study 283 sessions. So, that is the gist of that. Then, how is the structure of the police? How is it inadequate to deal with these matters? And so, th that is the third chapter. The fourth is an experience which was there, uh, the thug, suppression of thug. 
between 1828 and 1843 by a remarkable man called Sleeman. How did he do it? He did it through what is called a federal police. And the next is, uh, I have uh, written about uh, the emergency. The emergency, to, uh, you know, 21 years, 21 months of emergency was a time when we were a unitary state in which the entire initiative went from Delhi. Then the next is, I have uh, written a whole chapter about 2611, you know, my impressions about it, what went wrong, etc. Et and the last chapter is, what, how do we uh, improve the situation? Unless we have uh, the concurrent initiative by the center, I am not saying that the state should be deprived of the police and law and order, but I am only saying that in terms of uh, national security, internal security, the, the uh, state should have concurrent power of intervening. That is the theme of this book. What exactly is the, uh, the security position in India? Now, is terrorism the only problem? Railway accident, I, I've just, at random I picked up some uh, statistics. Railway accident, 27,000. In Mumbai itself, in 2016, how many people died while crossing track? Then highway accident is so much, 1 lakh, 146,000. Then ferry accidents, as again, this terrorism has caused only 66,220 uh, deaths, including 31,000 terrorists between 1994 and 2017. I am not trying to say that these things, these are infrastructural inadequacy. Now, very recently you must have read that in Elvinson to uh, Elvinson railway passenger, I think they in Champion about 50 people died. Now, all these things contribute to insecurity and, uh, and in a way, now for example, if a train is stopped in Mumbai, there will be a riot. So, all these things contribute to that. So it is not just the external threats like uh, terrorism which is responsible for our poor law and order, but something like in better infrastructure. What do we discuss this? Now why I come to Singapore to discuss this particular thing? When it is a purely an internal matter. Some people may say that look, we shouldn't talk about our problems outside. But then I want to remind you that the concept of security has undergone a vast change from the 90s. It is no longer, there is a recognition of non-military source of instability. And there is also a moving away from the state sovereignty within the territorial border. Now, a lot of uh, work has been done in Singapore on what is called NTS, non-traditional security threats flowing beyond national borders, like uh, transnational crime, interstate and internal conflict, migration, ecological issues. Now, you, you read about the Rohingya, uh, the problem created by Rohingya exodus. Now, it is not confined only to Myanmar, but it is also uh, the whole of South Asia is suffering because of that. You know, India has taken a stand which is, uh, there was an international commission in 2001 on intervention in state sovereignty. They recommended concept of sovereignty as a responsibility and not a control. There is a world of difference between so uh, responsibility and, and control. You can't have only control with no responsibility for internal security. Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew himself had said, the world is far too interdependent for any country to insulate itself from the rest of the world. This, I quote, what is the uh, distinct, uh, rather, relationship between economic development and internal security? We keep on saying that we should have economic development, economic development. Can we have uh, economic development without the proper law and order, without peace, without internal security? I invite your kind attention to Officer Danny Roderick of J.F. Kennedy School on the close relationship. This is a very old lecture that he had given and uh, in, in 1997 in honor of uh, Dr. Rolf uh, you know, the Untaxed Founding Fellow. This, incidentally, the second lecture of this was given by Mrs. Indira Gandhi. First was given by Dr. Rolf Presbyt uh, himself. The effect of shocks on growth is larger, the greater the latent social contact in an economy and the weaker institutes of conflict management. So he says that unless you have robust institution within the territorial borders to guarantee security, you cannot have economic development. This is another uh, report, A Million Voices, which has just come out and a uh, report of 88 national consultations. The report was after 88 national consultations and they have formulated five principles. 
and uh, they said that uh, rule of law and economic development, citizenship and social and economic justice, the most important thing is preventing, mitigating, deterring, controlling crime and violence. My complaint is that since 1947, we have not been able to set up adequate or proper institutions to ensure this particular thing. There, of course, we are left it to the state. And uh, I forgot to mention that 2611, if the center had concurrently intervened, and as I said, you know, it could have been prevented. Now, I quote a concrete instance, very recent incident, Panchkula riots. Now, about 2 lakhs, or 200,000 supporters of Godman, Gurmits, Ram Rahim, were allowed to congregate in Panchkula court, around Panchkula court, where the old case uh, regarding the 2002 rape case was being heard. And then they all knew, the entire uh, visual media was talking about it, that they'll be, they're agitated, that this, they are that rumors, etc. They're collecting petrol and nothing happened. There was a blatant political interference preventing the police from taking action against the assembly of that is what the allegations are, and I do not know if some inquiry commissions have been instituted, but at least it was common to everybody who watched this whole thing. And then when the conviction came, there was a sudden rise in 36 deaths, uh, scores of injured, three states paralyzed, railway station, 40, 485 trains cancelled. And the sad part of it is that the same state had witnessed similar disorder during the what is called the chart agitation. How is it learned, sir? Now, this is another thing which is now coming up. Now, uh, according to my tabulation, this may be uh, still outdated. 24 minority members were killed and 124 injured during the last three years. When the central government has asked, say, legally we cannot do anything, we have told the states to take action. And officially on 21st July, the center told the Supreme Court that the states, not the center, are really responsible for controlling such crimes. Now, that is certainly creating uh, uh, a panic in India. Let me go back into history. Babri Gansi's demolition on 6 December 1992. Now, Government of India stationed 20,000 paramilitary forces in, in Ayodhya in order to ward off the danger of this huge congregation coming. 200,000 protesters had come from all over India. They were allowed to assemble by the, uh, by the BJP government in, uh, in UP against the central orders or uh, warnings. And then on 6 December, Papri Nash is demolished. In the resultant countrywide common rights, 2,026 people were killed. And was it avoidable? Perhaps yes. Now, I want to contrast. Now, they, are, they keep on saying that India is a federal state. Actually, my argument is that India is not a federal state. India is only a union of states. Now, the perfect example of a federal constitution is the United States. What happened in 1954? I want to draw your kind attention to that. On May 17, 1954, Supreme Court declared all segregated schools as unconstitutional. But Arkansas governor didn't want to obey that because he was uh, pandering to his constituency, the white supremacists. Supremacists Oral fabulous uses National Guard. You know, in the USA, National Guards are under dual control. Orderly, they are under the control of the governor. But in time, terms of emergencies, the president can take it over. The National Guard will work for the president. So this is what you call a concurrent control over law and order. In in a most federal uh, country in the world, which has got, the states have got their own sovereignty, their own constitution, their own penal law. So, what happened is that the, uh, on, uh, the mayor of Little Rock appealed to the president. President Eisenhower sent U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Division to attack, I mean, escort the nine Little Rock, Rock Nine. They, those two students were called as nine Little Rock Nine, I mean, uh, 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 to the school. He also took out the 10,000 Arkansas National Guard out of the ground. I just wanted to make a distinction between the contrasting situation, what happened in the United States in a very tense situation, and then in India. Now, the, here is the old problem. India is the only major country where central government does not have uh, legal responsibility or internal security, except it centrally at rural states or during grave emergencies. When there is an emergency, you can take over the whole state, but not otherwise. 
or internal security system, this I have already said that. Security management is by state police in 29 states and seven unit territories with the federal police, NIA, from 2008, this is after the 2611 attack, with very limited powers. What happened is that in, uh, in uh, 2014, Tamil Nadu refused NIA investigation into a bomb attack uh, of Gauhati Bangalore Express, where the bomb exploded near Chennai railway station, killed a uh, Tata consultancy services worker, she died. And the NIA found a pattern of, uh, there was a pattern of bombing when Prime Minister Modi, he was not the Prime Minister that time, Prime Minister Kandid Modi was addressing uh, Gandhi Maidan in, on 27th October 2013. And in that bomb attack, six people were killed. And then similar bomb attacks had come in Roorkee, Uttarakhand and uh, Bangalore, 28th December 2014. This incident took place earlier, May 1st. So they said that it is one transaction or rather one, one thread of uh, crime going on. Let's investigate. Uh, yeah, Tamil Nadu uh, government and her, uh, Ms. Jailalka, the late uh, Chief Minister, refused, saying that no, we will investigate, we are very competent. It's not a question of competence, it's a question of one transaction, one gang or one, one group. That, is, that was not done. Central does not have legal power, even in interstate crime or terrorism, to initiate action unless ordered by headquarters or invited by the states. The, if the states invite, yes, they can do it. This is a, I am just saying that how in the initial years this was okay, this was tolerated or rather first responder held by central intelligence agencies. Now the, presently the only role the cell government plays is advisory and giving intelligence. But then that's not enough. When the, when the state don't do it, they have to intervene. Initially the state, uh, states were able to do it. In Maoists were confined only to West Bengal. However, when the security cha challenge went out of control, even for ordinary law and order, they have to get the sunny force. So, the pity is that the states left to themselves are not able to control when they require the central forces, but they do not give uh, transfer the right of intervention to central government. This circle is very, very important. This was actually, this is how the internal security is managed all over the world, except in India. Now, here the outer circle uh, uh, is what you call the uh, uh, security of the state. Uh, sorry, the inner, innermost circle is the most crucial, which is security of the state. The next circle is public order, and then the, the, the next one is law and order. So, this is actually a judgment by Justice Hidayatullah in as early as 1966, and R. N. Lohia, you must have heard about Lohia. He was an as a opposition socialist leader, he was an agitator. So, this was a case of Raran Lohia versus Bihar. So, Hida, Justice Hidayatullah said that the maintenance of public order is more serious than law and order, which is of local significance. Law and order is only local significance. So, in a way, by implication, the states with limited capability should have been empowered only to deal with law and order as in other countries. Or the center should have been empowered to regulate the two inner circles. If you see this two inner circles, the center should have had the concurrent power to intervene in that and, and not being allowed to not to enter. Now, failure to do this has made the state dealing with all the three circles, including security of state. Incidentally, espionage, security of state, everything is being investigated by the states. That I will come to that just now. Now, what has happened over a period of time? In the beginning, we had only the three main penal laws. One is Indian Penal Code, Criminal Procedure Code, of course, how to pro prosecute then the Evidence Act. And Indian Penal Code was the mother uh, penal law of India. You now, various states have found uh, their own, uh, you know, uh, amendments and all that. Then the states also have found their own penal law depending upon the local situation. But there are hundreds of what we call minor acts. Minor acts, is, it doesn't mean that they are minor. But the minor acts mean they are not as important as the National Law like Indian Penal Code. They are like Dowry Prevention Act. Then uh, various, so many uh, actions. Now, over a period of time, the police in India are heavy, heavily, uh, you know, burdened with the investigation of the, they are called local and special laws. Local and special laws are these things. Social protection reforms, municipal laws, moral policing. Now, in Mumbai, there is this bar dance, I think, beef law now. 
we've lost that the entire state machinery is only to implement uh, the, the, the anti cow protection laws, etc. etc. So, 67 percent of the workload is of this, and only 33 percent cases are of internal security, like a major uh, direct bearing on uh, security. But what has happened is that these 67 percent cases have got higher visibility. Now, there was a case in which the relations of two film actors quarrel in a pub in Mumbai. And for the next three, four days, the police were only busy investigating that. Did you quarrel? Did you quarrel? Did you meet each other? Now, in terms of public security or national security, it's an insignificant thing. But then, since the VIPs, uh, uh, you know, hit each other, that became very important. TV screens also. And law and uh, uh, L and L laws have more media visibility. Quality of major crime investigators suffer. I'll only quote one example. In 2004, now the proverb will delay in our uh, cases being heard. 2004, Sambaji Brigade, they went and ransacked a wonderful institution called Bandarkar Oriental Institute and completely smashed because of the protests against one book by James Lane. It is in terms of importance of uh, the historical importance, Bandarkar Institute is one of the best institutes in the whole of India. Our entire paper, everything was destroyed. Now they all been acquitted in uh, in uh, very recently. Then the next is during our uh, 2011 inquiry, we went deep into the deployment of uh, of uh, policemen in in Mumbai. We found that out of about 56,000, 12,000 people were all busy with miscellaneous duties, ministers, houses, and other things, and only uh, 2,000 people, uh, 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 you know, were available for. Only 12,000 policemen out of 50,000 were available for security duties and current duties for 14.41 million people, you know, 603 kilometer area. Others are busy with VIP protection, moral policing, protocol jobs. We are not, we find that the state's police inherited the British or princely say legacy of being the only civil coercive instrument. They didn't have any other system. They didn't have municipal police, they didn't have anything else. So, they, the entire thing of enforcement of all the penal laws and other things were dumped on the police. And there was no change at all after independence. As a result, several non-police functions besides responsibly investigating of all major criminal laws were uh, dumped on the police. 1861 Police Act imposed 22 responsibilities on police including municipal duties like stray cattle, impounding or prevention of street dirty. 1951 Bombay Police Act imposed 14 additional duties like control of infection, disease and offensive orders. And more and more, I think now the, with the effect that the latest thing is the High Court uh, 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 judgment that all illegal constructions in Mumbai city, Maharashtra, should be prevented by the police or investigated by the police. Now this is it's just not their work. There should have been special uh, investigating agency for this. I mentioned this already. Court ruling uh, October 20, 2015, Bombay High Court, that police should be detected now. This is this already. And Maharashtra Regional Town Planning Act. Despite the protest from the police, it is still the... Now, uh, as a result, India has got the maximum. Now, our people are saying that no police, uh, we should have more police. When I inquired, I, I mean, when I investigated, when I did the result, I found that we have the maximum number of police. I have given the figures now. 209027, that is our uh, figures of 2013. Total is about 3 million uh, we have got. And Russia has got 1 million. USA has got 1 million. China has got uh, 1 million. Mumbai police, it is 70s, 17,000. Now it is about 53,000. I have given the figures of London Met and NYPD also. So, we keep on complaining that uh, we are short stop, we are short stop. You are creating gigantic city police beyond the control of anybody. That is not good for security at all. Now, how did this situation arise? Now, this is what I said. I already mentioned about 1935, uh, 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 you know, Government of India Act. We copied that. Actually, at that time, the British governors were empowered. They had special responsibilities. But when we translated that into our constitution, those special powers were taken away because we are a part of the Republic. So there is nothing wrong with that. Now, central. Now, the, what has happened is that the central intervention is only by taking over 
state administration under Article 356, which is controversial. You know, because they don't, nobody wants their government to be taken over by the central government. Kanville Austin, who is a great authority, the late Kanville Austin, what, what happened? It is not that our founding fathers were not very intelligent or anything like that. In fact, they had set up some admirable institutions in Indian constitution, like the elections and all that. He said that, among other things that the founding fathers and mothers could have imagined but did not provide for the constitution, was the decline in Congress party's popularity and legislative representation, especially in parliament, although from the vantage point of the late 40s, this was remote. It was nevertheless conceivable. Now, he wrote this in 1967, and this is, I quoted from 1999 edition. Now, what has happened is, as a result, there is a clear conflict between Article 355. Now, what does Article 355 uh, say? It shall be the duty of the union to protect every state against external aggression and internal disturbance. Now, when this one school had right to play. The innocent people, their business were destroyed, their cars were destroyed, their buses were destroyed. Who will protect them? You see, when the state police is not able to do it, under either under political pressure or not, who will protect them? It is central government just to do it. And to ensure that government of every state is carried out in accordance with the provisions of the constitution. Effectively, my argument is that Schedule 7, in, in terms of, I am not a constitutional lawyer, I am not even a lawyer, but my common sense says, that when there is a shed, uh, when there is an article, it takes precedence over the schedule. Schedule is only a list. Schedule can be amended. How did Schedule 7 override an Article 355? This needs to be corrected so that center has the uh, has the concurrent responsibility. They don't have to intervene every day. But as I said, those circles, those in two inner circles, to maintain that, to maintain the solidarity of India, they need to intervene. Now, I have co compared what is the situation in New York, other police systems share the security responsibility. Now, look at the number of, there are 16 different police forces in New York area. Also, the private sector, American Hotel and Lodging Association, have threat analysis and crisis management capability, capability independent government, because they didn't want to trouble the uh, government. Apart from that, in New York, there is what is called NYPD Shield. 3,000 private managers sit next to uh, you know, uh, uh, next to the police people and, and implement this. Now, US has 40, UK has 44 territorial police and also various uh, national police. Even Pakistan has got it, whereas India has only one system of police. So, this I have uh, mentioned about the national police, Brazil and Pakistan, uh, national police. We don't have to do all that. We, uh, all my recommendation is that the center should be given concurrent power because under 355, they have to protect the states. Solution lies in our history. I mentioned about the thugs, how, how uh, uh, Sleeman did it between 1829 and 1848, leading to a tremendous amount of, you know, his policing was the ideal thing. His biographer said that whatever, for the next 60 years, people did not know what, what to do. And, uh, and, and he had laid down all this good policing. 4,500 thugs were prosecuted in two courts, leading to conviction. Many of them were sentenced to death. Many of them were transported to, uh, other, I mean, to Malaya and other areas, except 250. In 1950, the then Home Minister, Mr. Ali asked uh, B. N. Malik, who was the Director of Intelligence Bureau, six months to get rid of Telangana rebellion. He did it. And that same thing, uh, a temporary uh, transfer of a particular piece of a state, a portion of a district, or, or has been recommended by Justice Punji Commission, what is called localized emergency center group. Now, on 21st May 2013, center asked state to create municipal police in that city. Not one state has done. So, concrete said, this is my last slide. All non-police duties to be separated, special bodies to investigate social reforms law, creation of municipal police, one, All India Police for Railways, Private Security Guard, part of internal security architecture in New York and Singapore, Auxiliary Police or even private groups for escort of prisoners. Now, in Singapore, the prisoners are escorted by Auxiliary Police, but not by the regular police. In England, it has been handed over to a private security company. Federal Police, NIA should be strengthened to take over all terror cases and serious interstate crime immediately. Thank you very much. That's my... Thanks so much for a, an enormous overview and a comprehensive one of
the kind of institutional structure, the legal uh, regime uh, governing uh, uh, particularly the role of the police forces. Um, I didn't know, for instance, that India had the largest police force, and I, I'm one of those, uh, I guess, who's guilty of suggesting that India's police force was too small. Uh, but I base my figure on the ratio of uh, police to, uh, you know, a million population or whatever, where India doesn't come out so well. Um, uh, but clearly, I mean, the problem is more than a mechanical one relating to the number of policemen and the kinds of deficiencies one typically hears about, which is, uh, are they armed properly? Do they have enough uh, machines and surveillance equipment? And so on and so forth. Uh, you're pointing to a much deeper constitutional, legal, and political problem. Uh, and I think uh, that's a, a original and, and uh, of course, a very difficult problem at the same time. There's a, an assumption that runs through the talk, which is that centralization is good of power and security power. Um, and the protection of the state at the center of your circle. Um, but then what, what about when you consider Catalonia? They're trying to do the opposite, aren't they? They're trying to get away from centralization and the state. Uh, I remember uh, listening to one of the speeches of uh, Prime Minister Modi, I suppose when he was not the Prime Minister, when he said that uh, uh, ideally the intelligence should be separated from the law and order functions and he recommended that the, gov that the government should set up a completely different intelligence service. But like more than three years have uh, passed, do you see any um, uh, progress in this uh, of uh, requirement. I was under the impression that the Home Ministry and the Home Minister in India were extremely powerful, but it was not at all mentioned in your talk. Um, I presume they are responsible for internal security, so was that deliberate? Is it a misconception that they are powerful, or why haven't they played a role in correcting all these problems? There is nothing wrong with democratic decentralization. But when you want to hold the country together, a huge country like India, you know, you, you cannot allow the states to decide everything. You know, for example, economic development, then the law and order, then whom to prosecute, whether to prosecute, whether to allow the mobs to come, etc. As far as I understand, the decentralization was recognized in the old Spain's constitution. I have not studied the problem at all. I have only read uh, some of these. Now, tomorrow, Scotland also can ask for more autonomy. But even in, in UK, including, you know, uh, I've studied the, the policing in UK. There is a separate law for England and Wales, there is a separate law for Scotland, there is a separate law for, uh, for uh, Northern Ireland. But yet, there are these uh, national police people who can implement certain, uh, or rather investigate certain crimes. Now, the problem is, in India, there is no such provision at all. Now, NIA, NIA is, was, what happened is in 2001. That's you, the you know, uh, National Investigation National Agency. Agency. I think if you could just uh, yeah, yeah, tell yeah, people what these yeah, are because yeah. they're not so, familiar. Uh, you see, what, what happened was that we had this Kargil attack, Kargil incident. Afterwards, three, four uh, competent, uh, uh, you know, committees were appointed to go into what was law and order, one was internal security, the other was defense. Uh, third was intelligence and fourth was uh, uh, border security. And oh, so all of them, they recommended, they made recommendations. In 2001, the previous BJP regime, Mr. Adwadi was the Deputy Prime Minister, they had a GOM, uh, you know, uh, the, there is a group of ministers, they recommended certain uh, reforms, internal security reforms to then Prime Minister. But by one of them was a national police, which was something like FBI or something like uh, the, the, the serious uh, crime office of UK to go into the whole question of national interstate crime and investigate and transnational also on the road. This was never implemented. That answers your question of MHA. MHA bureaucracy sat over the file and never even bothered about this. Now, they may be apparently powerful, but I think in functional areas, I don't think they are that powerful at all. So, the, the question is, as long as the economic development is, uh, is decentralized, there should be no, no problem at all. But my experience, my argument is this, I have tried to justify in my book, 
that if you leave it to the states only to control, they go by the local interest. Now, in this particular case, this, this Godman's case, it was because he had such lot of followers that, that they were allowed to do anything, you know, for the purely political reasons. So, I think that particular model may not apply to India. And I don't want to comment on uh, that uh, Catalan uh, demand for, uh, you know, for autonomy and all that. I don't want to, uh, you know, as it is now, the states are quite autonomous, quite autonomous in many ways. But this particular thing, they are uh, preventing the, any initiative by the center to set right certain injustices. Because what has happened is that when you have a constitutional responsibility to protect the minorities, to protect others from rights from the major people, and if, it, if the state is not able to do it, it is an abdication of the constitution. That is my argument. Uh, and, 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 yes. You see, this uh, uh, Mr. Modi had made a uh, very good uh, suggestion when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat that the uh, intelligence should be separated from the police. Uh, this intelligence being done by the police is a British uh, a colonial experience where they wanted uh, uh, a coercive power to do intelligence also, you know, to, to prevent the uh, independence struggle and all that. Unfortunately, we continued that. I also agree, although I am a police officer, I worked in the police for 17 years. And I agree that the police are not well suited for intelligence. But the creation of non-police, non, when you say police law and order, non-police law and order, creation of intelligence branches has been a failure in most of the states. Maharashtra, for example, after 2611, they recruited a number of people. They built a very nice looking academy in Pune. And uh, halfway through, after three months, they all ran away to IT jobs. So, unfortunately, that has not been a very, very successful experiment. And uh, uh, coming back to Union uh, Home Ministry, they are powerful in the sense that they can control certain things like uh, the appointment of uh, Indian police service officers and other things, all those things. But in terms of actual intervention, this was the case not only with the present government, but the previous government also. When Maoist uh, uh, violence was going out of control, the only thing the then Home Minister could do was to appeal, go on appealing to the state, please do, please do, please do. Uh, couldn't do anything else. He could have, like uh, what happened in 1952, when Mr. Raj Gopal was the Home, Min Home Minister at that time, he told the Director of Intelligence Bureau, the only occasion in a democracy where an intelligent chief was given total power to stop in a in a whole area, in the, what you know, 3,000 villages, that whole area which had risen and become independent, he, he controlled it. That is the only experience, and that Justice Punji had recommended. So, the power comes only when you exercise it. Right now, they have no power at all. Okay, we'll take a second round. So, Rani, uh, gentleman at the back, I'll come to you. And then this lady here. Yeah, go ahead. You make an argument about changing the structure for a uh, more well-integrated, centrally supervised uh, security regime. But, but some of the examples that you present are uh, talking about sort of uh, issue, a uh, problem of focus and capacity of the security forces that are there. My question is, how do you guarantee that if you shift these to the national level, these larger issues of competency, capacity, um, what they focus on, you know, that they don't spend their time looking after the VIPs rather than doing that. How do you, you might have the same problem of capacity and focus at the national level. How do you address that? Well, I'm a professor, so I'm not an expert on India, but I have seen that in a lot of history, that this a federal state power separation is always a big issue. Particularly, if you uh, put it in the historical background of sectarianism and uh, religious issues. Now, it seems, it seems that my understanding of your talk is that there's a very serious problem operational effectiveness for the state to protect itself at the state levels. So the federal government has to assert more powers. But with this issue of operational effectiveness and this issue of the bigger picture of separating the power of the federal government and the uh, peripheral state, 
being is interpreted as an attempt to impose dominant majority view either in religion or simply because the center wanted more powers. Because if this is going to be misinterpreted, then the issue of religious uh, fighting, the issue of sectarianism, and India, as you pointed out, has a very bad experience on that. So how are you going to assure the people it's just for operational improvement and not a power grab from the center? I was curious to know about uh, the, when you said that in the constitution, a schedule overrides the article. So in terms of security, is this the only uh, conflict that you see in terms of the constitutional uh, specific, uh, specific details? And also, if, for example, the executive wants to actually implement this, so if they go on into a restructuring program, what are the challenges they will have in terms of uh, getting a parliamentary consent as well as in terms of in getting a, like a majority? Like, if they want to actually implement this, then what are the immediate challenges that you face. Your uh, question about uh, uh, the central police effectiveness, you know, I had done a study of all the common rights which had happened in, in, in India after the independence. In fact, they became so big that I didn't, I cut out that whole chapter. You know, you know the, uh, the publishers want, didn't want a, a huge uh, volume. They wanted, actually this is a simply, uh, you know, it's written for the common man. Not, this is not an academic publication. Because the HarperCollins said that if you introduce too much of jargon and too much of the, uh, you know, the, it will not, not be, it's not an academic. But, but while writing this, I did a research of all the common rights. Now what has happened is that the pattern is, that in the beginning there was abdication by the local police because of local interest either on religious or on sectarian or anything, could be anything. But when the central police came, when the, the central reserve police or any other police which came to help them, the local people, affected people welcomed it because they were not from the local locality and they were uh, doing it in a much impartial manner, more effective manner. That is the pattern that I found in all the major riots in India. So that is that is uh, one thing because we expect them to be impartial. They are not from the local. But as you know, at the height of Punjab insurgency, Tamil Nadu police had gone down because they had nothing to do with the Punjabi culture. In the similar way in, in the other states also. So I I'm, I'm from the past experience of uh, from forty seven. I can say that a central police, if they intervene, intervene it doesn't mean every day intervene only selected, like for example, when they found that the Maharashtra police were not doing anything against uh, when the, you know, uh, 16 intelligence reports had come. But this type of attack will go to attack, come to Bombay. It will be a seaborne attack, it will be a commando attack, the targets will be selected and they are not going to run away like other people. They will not put bombs, they will stand and fight. Despite that, Maharashtra government was left, they were supposed to do coastal patrolling, not one meeting was held anywhere. So with the effect that the coastal patrolling was a big joke. And uh, you know, so this type of thing will not happen. When you are giving a professional view to this, and if the central government had decided, yes, 16 intelligence alerts were given by the federal government, central government, and the uh, government has not even convened even one meeting to, to sort of beef up the security. Now, when the, uh, I'm slightly deviating and uh, find out how the other police had tackled that. When 2011 took place, the Department of Homeland Security uh, in the same year, 2008, had prepared in April 2008 a, a protection plan of all the coastal uh, cities of the uh, United States. And they had said that we are expecting such a seaborne attack from Al-Qaeda either on uh, oil installation or on major cities, etc., etc. When 2011 took place, they find all the city-states facing the sea, like Miami and San Francisco and New York and all that. They went into overdrive of protection. You know, all the drills and other things were formulated. Not one police in India did anything like that. Until Mr. Chidamara had to tell them to conduct exercises about the efficacy of your police. Now, this is the problem if you leave internal security to the states, national security, which is a bearing on the national security.
So that is why uh, I, I find that a higher level, a macro level view has to be taken about what constitutes internal security. And my experience is that they have been much more effective and important. And uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, religious uh, dominance. No, this, this power of intervention, as I said, is not to be used politically. There will be judicial, uh, you know, uh, accountability in this also, like uh, like in United States also has it. But un if you do not have the power, you will get all these beef riots. It's going on, it's spreading panic in among minority people. And the Union Home Ministry has told the Supreme Court, we have no power. The states have to do it. But when the state don't do it, what do we do? Do do we go to the Supreme Court in every case? We can't do that. The center cannot abdicate. That is why I said. There is a uh, constitutional, you mentioned that, there is a clear abdication or rather the schedule has, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, overridden the constitutional provision. It is a constitutional pro uh, uh, responsibility. In fact, in the 2611 chapter, I quoted the constitutional provision. To tell the central government at that time that they saying that you have failed. It is a constitutional obligation, you have failed. So, uh, these, these things, you know, it has to be interpreted properly. Unfortunately, what has happened is that no case has gone to the Supreme Court. I'm sure, with my limited knowledge of constitution, uh, if, if it goes to the government, they will part out. I think that 2611 has been an abdication of constitutional responsibility by the then Sun government, UK government. I mentioned about 355 and Schedule 7. Is there anything else you want to no, she, Her question is, how will Parliament get over? Ah, okay, parliament. How will you create the conditions in Parliament to, you see, to change you the, have to the law? Lobby. <laughs> you have to lobby with the Parliament. You know, many of our people do not know these small, small points from the national point of view. In fact, in this, I have said it is the failure of leadership of the previous government, UK government, in convincing that they ruled in there for 10 years. You should have convinced the states, look, we are not, why are the states afraid? States say that if you take away the police, nobody is going to take away. Your police is going to be with you. You know, in, in, in USA, there is in, in, double jeopardy. Does not work in some cases. A murder can be a federal crime, a murder can be a state crime. A man can be prosecuted by federal law as well as by the state law. It is, a, it is accepted law. So, why are you afraid? The police will continue to be, they will keep on saluting you. You know, wherever you go, they will keep on saluting you. But that is what they are afraid of. That if you take away the police, who will salute me? Nobody will salute me. No, the police will continue to be with you. But in rare cases, in important cases like 2611, when there is a constant, you know, from 2006 onward, the intelligence was red alert was coming. But state government didn't do anything. That will not happen. That will not happen in this case of consistent breach of national security. So it will be maybe about one case a year. But you should have, to uh, answer your question, the, uh, the Home Ministry should have the power to do this. And like in USA, as I said, the states are so autonomous in the in United States. Each has got constitution, penal law and sovereignty. So I think, you know, we have to lobby the parliament. There is no other go because they don't know. Do you think that uh, the interpretation of the term internal disturbance, uh, which is in Article 355, uh, as you said, is the responsibility of the center to protect uh, the country or the state from internal disturbance. So there have been instances in the past when the, the interpretation of the term internal disturbance was only when there is some armed rebellion or, you know, some very, uh, like, that sort of uh, disturbance in the, in the country. Uh, you mentioned uh, examples of Jat agitation, cow vigilantism and Gurmit Ram Rahim, the recent case. So, do you think that this, all these examples fit in these interpretation of internal disturbance? If not so, then how can center uh, kind of uh, take that as a responsibility to control these kind of situations? Post 911, uh, one of the uh, initiatives that the US government did 
was to set up uh, fusion centers where all the law enforcement agencies came together uh, and worked together. Yeah, sure. yeah. that, that's right. So I, I think uh, you know, post uh, 2611, after the Mumbai attacks, one of the recommendations was also to set up uh, fusion centers uh, you know, for, for the local law enforcement. I wanted to know, sir, uh, is there any initiative taken by the Indian government in that direction? The local experience is actually that police intelligence is much more successful in preventing disorder than uh, other forms of intelligence. Uh, uh, the example that's always given here in colonial policing is during the Malaya emergency. And the contra uh, contrasting example is the Northern Ireland example. But that was because there the police were hopelessly penetrated, so they had to use the military. Now, your example of the Arkansas. In Arkansas, the situation as I read it is that the Arkansas Guard were willing uh, to respond to the order to federalize. In other words, they were disciplined enough to accept the federal authority. Uh, and uh, this is beside the fact that nobody wants to go up against these uh, paratroopers, right? Now, in India, are uh, the state police willing to accept discipline? from the central government. Uh, the other question, uh, I'm told that in India, the Indian Police Service actually provides uh, uh, leadership to the state forces. Is that not a way to um, collaborate, to have some form of uh, coordination between state forces? Uh, my question is the role and effectiveness of judiciary or timely uh, judgment of the police case is right. That's part one of the question. Part two is the tourism sector takes a serious toll because of the law and order. So do you think in the future you will see any kind of tourism policy specific for tourism, tourism places? You made a point earlier about it has to be lobbied in the parliament. Considering that's the context, uh, could it be that a sitting MP can introduce a bill to do an amendment of the schedule that conflicts the article? You asked for 355 internal disturbances. You see, there has been no case law on that. What exactly is internal disturbances has not been defined. But common sense says that any disturbances which disrupts civil life uh, can be called as an internal disturbance. It could be a, an ordinary riot, which of course is only for the local thing. But when four states are uh, you know, affected in the latest uh, that particular riots, 455 trains have been uh, cancelled. About uh, 50 buses were burnt, 200 cars were burnt. That is that can be a serious thing, you know. It, uh, it can be that can be also internal disturbance. A small riot or drunken behavior also can be a riot. But you have to read, read it according to the circumstances. You know, as I said, you know, for a jat agitation, the entire railway line between Rajasthan and uh, Haryana, right up to Punjab, they were all disrupted. So th that also is a detailed decision. But there is no judicial judicial explanation because that has not been tested at all. Somebody should have gone to court saying that 355, Article 355 is neglected because of uh, Schedule 7, because of this particular thing, because center has no, uh, you know, they, they have no uh, sort of power uh, to, to intervene. They want police, but those police people have no, no powers at all. I want to mention to you, even in Areas like JNK, Jammu and Kashmir, or in Northeast, where the armed forces special powers are, are acting in operation. According to strict law, they have no independent power. They can assist the local police. They have no independent power. It's not like a martial law where the army can go and do it. But then, of course, they do certain things in uh, addition to the local police. So the responsibility, legal responsibility is still that of the local police. But then that is not being done. The, the, why the uh, Armed Forces Special Powers Act is unpopular is because the army sometimes arrests certain people, keeps them, interrogates them, uh, and uh, then because under the Army Act and all those things, but then those things don't come at all in penal law. Penal law, it is what is important is the, the Indian Penal Court, Criminal Procedure Court, and Evidence Act. You have to go by that. This cannot be tried in the Army Act because. Uh, they will be almost like a martial law. So we have to remember that it is the state police which is which is the legal responsibility has got legal responsibility in prosecuting all these things and the central police have no central reserve police have no power, they can only assist. Now, what happened was that in Maoist areas, Chhattisgarh and all that the central reserve police had gone in a very big way to help 
no people. Then the clashes came between them. There was, uh, the CRP would blame the local police that leaking out information uh, and the local police will say that these people don't know the difference between this and that and all those things, you know, it becomes like that. On the other hand, if they are given concurrent power for a limited period, that is what Justice Punji had recommended, for a very limited period. We don't want to take out the whole state. Right now under 356, you take out the whole state, which is, uh, you know, very controversial because you may take over a Congress-run state. When the Congress was ruling the center, you may take over a BJP ruled state. But no, Unji said even a part of a district, like Sukumar district in Chhattisgarh, can be taken out as an experimental basis and run. The development will go hand in hand with the law and order. Uh, it will be like a collector, you know, like that. And that will be a central nominee. That is that was what was successful in 1952 Telangana rebellion. So that is, I answer now, uh, in the fusion center. We have something like fusion centers, but during our 2611 inquiry, we found that that is not functioning at all. What actually fusion centers in the United States is, it is not only the intelligence agencies and local law and order, but also private security people attend. And they, and to that extent, the security, private security people are given security clearance. And they will discuss uh, intelligence which is coming from the uh, FBI or from the 16 national US agencies. They will say they have applicability of say California or Arkansas or whatever it is. And then they will contribute. The, the uh, intelligence is fused into actionable in, uh, information. And then if they have any comment, they will toss it up to the center. And uh, so it is a two-way traffic. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a dialogue. Whereas in India, what is happening is during 2011, we were told, it is the representative of the army will come and say, this is all what I got. I can't, I don't know what to say anything for it. The, that is not fusing. It is only, you are just throwing into, into the melting pot, you know, for what is it. Well, then how do you make out of, a sense out of, uh, it's very difficult. It's not being, my experience is it's not being followed properly. Now, then the other is uh, police intelligence. Who said that whether the state will accept uh, them or not? No, no. no. up there. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. sorry, yeah. The, no doubt, Indian police service people, I also belong to the Indian police service, uh, we are recruited by the government of India, trained by the government of India, and then allotted to the states. As long as we are with the states, we are under the control of the state government. If there is a clash between central instructions and the state, we have to follow the state's orders. So, in that way, it's not like in Pakistan. Pakistan, the home ministry, Pakistan interior ministry, can transfer an IPS officer from one state to the other. So, with the effect that that, that PPS officer, Pakistan police service officer, is worried. If I disobey the central directive, uh, I'll be in trouble. So, he will... Uh, you know, carry out certain uh, instructions from the central government properly. Now, in any case, these instructions do not go to the police at all. When the instructions go from the government of India, from the Home Ministry, or rather the, the advisories go, it goes to the civil chief secretary, civilian authorities, who pass it down to the police. That's what, that is the rule. So, it is not a question of willing, willingness to obey, or they don't want to defy it also. But the question is that the architecture, administrative architecture is, is such that you have to go uh, to the local home and home department, that is Maharashtra Home Department, uh, Gujarat Home Department, and uh, they will interpret what we should do to the uh, to carry out the uh, central uh, government directive. They cannot leapfrog and then go uh, to the center or rather get the center's idea. So that is the position right now. In fact, some of the police officers who uh, obeyed the summonses of, uh, it happened in Tamil Nadu, Ms. Jailalza. One lady, there was a lady IPS officer who obeyed the uh, instructions of the Union Home Minister and went and reported without the clearance of the state government. She was suspended by, by the state government. So this type of thing can happen. You see, judiciary, uh, 
unfortunately there is a lot of delay and now that is because a large number of cases are pending in the court and as i mentioned about the pune bandarkar case which was a 2004 case and it was ended in uh, i mean it resulted in a decision only in 2017 uh, you know 14 how many years uh, 13 years it has taken that and that that to the local court i can understand if it goes to the appeal and all that you know it will go on for the next uh, 25 years there is a lot of delay there is a shortage of courts now the courts are saying that the uh, the executive branch that is the government they are not giving us facilities and they are not allowing recruiting more and there is that that is going on that's a very sad uh, state of affairs with the effect that uh, the justice is not being delivered at all then tourism uh, tourism is definitely affected with the disorder there have been cases in which uh, very recently i think it is in agra a swiss couple they were so badly beaten up by the local uh, people uh, due to just uh, you know some local call this these people didn't have, they were speaking in french they these uh, people did not they were asking in french or the broken english but these uh, hoodlums who were playing cricket they came with a cricket bat and bashed them up and that poor man got head injured now this is no good in uh, welcoming tourism you can have incredible in there with the campaign and all that but then when it comes to question of and on the other hand the local police arrested this is couple for what i don't even know so definitely disorder will affect uh, tourism private member bill cannot be the constitution uh, uh, amendment has its own uh, formalities and the private member cannot introduce that that is that doesn't happen in fact i got uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, seven schedule uh, amendment regarding cooperative uh, law uh, that was affecting now uh, an interesting case was that of a constitutional amendment i am just reading it because i am not a lawyer constitutional amendment passed in the winter session that added a chapter on cooperative societies uh, the method chosen was to add a chapter to the constitution it is not clear whether this amendment would stand up to the charge that it effectively negates etc etc uh, across the three lists uh, there is a problem regarding the cooperative societies by the state so the uh, the procedure was uh, had undergone you know the constitutional amendment two third of the states have to concur with that and i do not think we have reached a stage in which a private members will will ever uh, stand the unless some state government introduces law or the government of india self government itself introduces law so you cannot have a constitutional amendment by a private members Okay, I think uh, we've reached uh, <laughs> that time, 6.30 exactly. Uh, I think we've done a, a brilliant job of keeping to time, you and your initial remarks and then uh, the questions. Um, I think we've had a, a wonderful tour through the very uh, great difficulties that India faces in dealing with uh, problems of law, law and order and internal security. I think the one thing that strikes me as being quite uh, interesting is that uh, a typical kind of response might be to say well you know per capita levels of law and order problems or even terrorism are very low in india uh so do you really want to intervene in the constitution and change article 355 and schedule 7 and all of that uh, just to deal with what seems to be a, a relatively low level of violence compared to most countries in the world on a per capita basis not in absolute terms so the effort to make such big constitutional changes would over would be overreach uh it wouldn't be worth it and i think the second question that i think probably is in everyone's minds is why are the state police so distracted so either incompetent or unable to follow up on what seem like common sensical things i mean the very striking example you gave us was of the unwillingness or inability of the coastal states in india to hold any kinds of remedial or practice drills uh, in coastal security after the mumbai 261111 attacks it just seems absurd you know but there's something there that doesn't allow the state to carry out common sensical due diligence uh, uh, what is that may i say something okay. you know about this uh, uh i have studied sleeman's case till sleeman came under lord bentick there was no question of an all india police 
did that. They never thought about it. And he has discussed, you know, there is that, he has written three wonderful books. If one could get it, it's their antique books, you know. Rambles and reflect, uh, Reflections of a Police Official. He goes from place to place, place to place. He was a man who was, you know, he was a military officer, young man. I, there is one chapter about him. And then he came out to India and then he became a, a magistrate. In those days, the British were the magistrates. And then later he became an investigative officer also. And when this thug uh, menace came, uh, he accidentally came into that. And then he started investigating. Very hardworking man. And in those days, the, in the case of thugs, there was not even a dead body available. The people used to go, those days the communications were not there. Hardly any communication, the uh, whole area was not back. There were princely streets. And then these caravans used to go, the travelers used to go, British army officers used to go. And then suddenly they will disappear. And then the relatives won't even know whether so and so is killed, etc., etc. This is the first thing. But at the same time, the British law at that time, it was during the East India, I mean, company's time. Their penal law was of such high standard that you need to have a dead body. Otherwise, how can you have a murder case? So, he personally uh, exhumed 1,000 dead bodies, personally. And a huge area, as because uh, the, the present England, he was, he, it was affected, thuggy affected. So, his achievement was, his biographer says, Mike Dash, historian, he says that his great achievement was that the, he made the police start thinking about a trans uh, state or an all India picture. There was no nothing like an all India in those days. British states, British states, that's all. So he started thinking about do, don't concentrate only on our crime in our area. But the problem and sad part, uh, part is that our states think only about the state, not about what will happen, this pillow or other, other thing. It is just that it didn't strike them. And when only Mr. Chidambaram asked them, you conduct exercises, then only they realize it. That is the problem of... So, actually this constitutional amendment is not that very difficult at all. I have quoted, we had a very illustrious officer called Mr. Narasimhan. I will just take two minutes. Mr. Narasimhan, who was number one of the first batch of Indian Police Service. He retired as the uh, Director of Intelligence, I mean, the Central Bureau of Investigation. He had uh, written an article in Hindu uh, in 2001. All it needs is a simple three, four words in the concurrent list. That's all what is required. You don't have to do anything. And the state will not lose anything. They will continue to operate. But center will, in terms of this type of national catastrophe, it may be, as I mentioned, one uh, issue a year or two issues a year. Not every year, every month, not every day. That needs to be... Uh, sort of empowered, the government of India needs to be empowered. And uh, uh, I want to just conclude one more joke. When I was in the US, I read one, uh, you know, there is a big fight going on in Kerala between the Communist Marxists and RSS people. And the RSS people, RSS are Rashtriya Sansai Vaksa, which is the uh, uh, voluntary body which is supporting the present government. So there have been a lot of murders, political murders. One, and their student body is called ABVP, Akhila Bharatiya Vidyatya Parishad. He had read my book and he says, this book should be implemented immediately, Center should take over uh, Kerala. That's not what I meant. That is not what I meant at all. And in fact, I don't want to contribute. I, want to, I don't want to go into politics at all. That is not what I said. Any government which rules Delhi should have the power of intervention uh, or other concurrent jurisdiction in terms of national politics. Well, please join me in thanking uh, our guests today.